This video is sponsored by Squarespace. Stay tuned to save 10% or more on your purchase and learn more about building your website. Something we get stuck on a lot with Sonic is how it should be. There's a lot of talk about what Sonic should look like, indicative of a series which loves to reinvent itself every couple of years. You could call this a bad thing, that Sonic just can't figure out what works and what doesn't. You'd be right, in a sense. Why can't Sonic just stick to one style? After the adventure games, you'd think they'd have all rights to move on to Adventure 3, to refine the ideas they had been steadily improving. Instead, we got... Sonic Heroes. It's actually funny how normal this shift in gameplay style and tone feels in retrospect. True to the character, the franchise has a bit of a commitment problem, which has likely led to the dozens of splinters we now see within its fanbase. At the same time, part of me doesn't blame them for heading in a new direction. Though the adventure games were mostly beloved, the games weren't exactly the faithful translation of the classics that some fans probably wanted. And if I'm honest, though Adventure 3 had several areas in which it could improve and evolve the formula, Adventure 2 is a pretty high note for that style of game to go out on. Why not experiment with what Sonic can be in 3D? An innocent question, once upon a time. So it was that Sonic Heroes came into being, and with it a style of gameplay that no one saw coming. You know, the more I write for this intro, the more I realize how Sonic Lost World released in essentially the same situation, adopting a new and different style of gameplay coming off one of the most beloved and critically acclaimed games in the franchise. Sonic Team are never ones to let a good idea stick. Eh? Despite it all, I kinda love it. There's a magic to Sonic Heroes, however unorthodox, and I wanna explore that. Why do I love Sonic Heroes, the beautiful, lovable mess? The Sonic franchise is unique in that its ideas are rarely ever appealing on paper. Sonic Adventure 2 is my pride and joy. It came together really well, but I don't know that I'd necessarily be singing the same tune were I only to glimpse its concept. It's got mech shooting set in modern-day San Francisco, with actual human beings who send their military robots to lock Sonic in prison. It's kind of weird. But I find that in spite of its ludicrous premise, maybe even sometimes because of its ludicrous premise, it remains a kick-ass video game. It doesn't really resemble what the classics had established as a traditional Sonic game, and yet I still think it's one of the best. Get upset at me for this, I know you will. Super Mario 64 is really nothing like the classic 2D Mario games. It had a completely different structure and style focused around collecting objects in large sandboxes with only occasional platforming, and people loved it. So much so that it created an entire subgenre. So I say, to hell with the concept of a series or franchise needing to be anything at all. Why do we care what it should be? If it's good, if it's fun, no matter how ridiculous it sounds, why should that matter? I mean, really listen to me when I say that conceptually, Sonic Heroes sounds like a bad idea. Twelve characters split into four different teams. Speed characters will control like Sonic usually does. Flight characters will shoot teammates at enemies and fly over gaps. And power characters will break objects and dispatch foes. Each character will be able to level up throughout the course of an act. The acts will be much longer on average, and many of them will have slower paced sections focused on combat. If I had no prior experience, and you just told me this basic premise, I'd naturally be a little hesitant. I don't exactly have anything against destroying enemies in a Sonic game, that's just another part of the platforming. But a focus on combat, where enemies will don larger and larger health bars, where part of the onus for the player to switch characters is in order to better deal with mini-bosses and the like, is a little outside my comfort zone. I don't know that I'm interested in a Sonic game with so much stop and start pacing. But much like the mech shooting gameplay of the adventure games makes very little sense on paper, I don't think words can really do heroes justice. When you sit down to play, or at least when I sit down to play, it starts to click. You're constantly switching between characters, trying to find the optimal way through enemy encounters to finish levels as quickly as possible. They ease you into it with Seaside Hill, where colored gates forcibly switch you to another character. Through this, you learn a set of priorities. Speed characters specialize in covering longer distances. They can quickly homing attack through enemies, they can perform the light speed dash, and they can rocket excel. 
but they're not exactly primed for combat. When you've just begun a stage, trying to kill enemies with them takes far too long, which is why you'll likely want to switch to the power character to deal with them. Power characters are much slower, but they have more combat utility. They can throw their teammates at enemies, they can dish out huge amounts of damage, generally they're your room cleaners. And then, sometimes, you'll run into a set of flying enemies in a chain. Sure, you can deal with them using Sonic or Knuckles, but again, it'll be a lot more awkward. Why not just switch to a flight character to stun those flying enemies, or flat out kill them depending on their level? You can pretty much use anyone to fight, but there's always a clearly better answer depending on what level your characters are. If your power or flight character is underleveled, maybe it's better to remove those annoying shields with the speed character's tornado attack, making it easier for the power character to finish the job. But if the speed character is a higher level, they can probably just kill the enemies themselves. It's the same for every character. And as you progress to future stages, the enemies will become much more resistant to certain character types. They'll start introducing metal flying enemies, which have to first be stunned by a flight character, and then dealt with using a power character. They'll introduce these big walkers with giant hammers, best dealt with using a power character, but maybe you can use a flight character to slow its movement and give you more opportunity for damage. The helmet variants only have one weak spot on top of their head, practically forcing you to figure out the fastest way to bring them to the ground. I think there's a really great sense of fluidity to the levels because of this. Whether it's a large gap you have to cross with a flight character, or a mini boss you have to take on with a power character, while it sounds a little bit like Simon says, you usually have to put the pieces together yourself, which is what makes it a satisfying decision. It isn't always just, oh, here's a light dash path, let's use Sonic. There are so many moments where you can use pretty much any character, and it's up to you to decide which of these three goobers will get you through this section as fast as possible. Sound familiar? A fundamental aspect I look for in Sonic games is their ability to be replayed and mastered by proficient players. Does it get more fun the more I play it? Do I learn more about these levels that I didn't know before? Can I figure out new ways to use the tools available to me to decrease my time spent in a level and raise my rank at the end? I think, for the most part, Team Sonic's levels follow this design philosophy. Seaside Hill and Ocean Palace introduce you to the basics. Sonic's fast, you should use him for the light dash rings and for narrow strips of land. You gotta switch to Knuckles when there are big blocks in the way, enemies aplenty, or gusts of air to ride. You switch to Tails when you need to reach higher, farther platforms, or to deal with airborne robots. There are some other things to consider, like who you switch to before entering a cannon, but for the most part, you're simply getting a good feel for where and when to switch in these two acts. As you progress, you run into more of these opportunities. Grand Metropolis introduces turtles you need to tornado attack with Sonic to flip over. If you can collect enough power-ups, though, you can just skip that step and kill them instantly, moving on to the next section much quicker. A lot of the time, exploring a level will reward you with these level-ups, giving you incentive to seek out hidden alcoves. These sections in the power plant are a really interesting showcase of a tried-and-true Sonic staple, vertical pathway selection. To stay on top, you have to make sure you land on each platform with tails while taking out the enemies. Falling will mean you need to take some extra time fighting enemies, most likely decreasing your rank at the end. This is where you're meant to flex your mastery over the level. There are sections like this dotted all over the game, and it feels as good as it ever has to maintain these higher pathways at a quick pace. I like combat in this game the most when it serves as a punishment for suboptimal play. It means that you can come back later and skip the fights entirely. Show them who's boss. In addition to sections like these, each level has a unique gimmick to play with. Grand Metropolis and Power Plant are all about these moving platforms. Casino Park and Bingo Highway put you onto pinball tables. Rail Canyon and Bullet Station revolve around grind rails. I love that not only each level, but each act has something new to contend with. It helps to keep the player on their feet. Rail Canyon has a lot of rail hopping, switching, and jumping. I think there's a healthy mix of spectacle, watching Sonic Tails and Knuckles blast off at high speeds, trains circling around them, and platforming, where you have to jump after crashing or switch to the correct rail. And by the next level, you'll be in a forest that springs to life before your eyes when it rains, bringing grind rails to life as you grind on them. My point is, even if one or two of these gimmicks aren't your cup of tea, they shake things up so much that you're never really stuck there for too long. 
This mechanical variety pairs incredibly well with the stage theming. I will go on record saying that in terms of aesthetic feel, Sonic Heroes is the best of the best. You spend two acts in each location. Seaside Hill is based more in the beach portion of the level. You see more of the green, the sand, and the rocks. But as you move further inland, you get to this white and red ocean palace standing above the water. Every level follows suit. You go from the frog forest, high as the clouds, the jungle far below you. The second act sees you descend into the thick of it, the lost jungle below, where you get to see more of the swamp and encounter the poisonous frogs. I love that frog forest has a more upbeat, cheery musical track. But as soon as you reach the jungle, it slows down. There are more enemies to fight. You're brought back down to Earth, in a sense. And if I'm honest, this is probably the worst that the level theming has to offer. Rail Canyon weaves beautifully into the larger plot, where Eggman is going to enact his evil doomsday in three days. By the time you reach Rail Canyon, you're running pretty low on time, so you enter the level already on the grind rails, barreling through the canyon and into the bullet station, where you systematically destroy each of them, shooting yourself out of Eggman's giant cannons to cross long distances in no time flat. There's a great sense of urgency here. The stakes are high, you really gotta get moving. And what better way to do that than to kick the guitars into high gear? Once you emerge from the jungle, you find yourself in a spooky castle, getting tossed and turned around by these gravity orbs. It's a little more creepy, a little more confusing, and so the backing track reflects that atmosphere. And as you trudge further into the mansion, you get the feeling that something isn't quite right here. Optical illusions, enemies flying out of paintings, entering strange ethereal dimensions. It's a mystic mansion, all right. One you need to get out of as fast as you can. But the star of the show, by far one of the best levels in Sonic history that I'm honestly not sure can ever be topped, you land on one of Eggman's ships, and... Egg Fleet, a level where you jump from ship to ship, blowing up Eggman's giant battleships, flying higher than the clouds, you're in the heart of it now, and there's nothing that's gonna stop you. After destroying most of his fleet, you finally reach the end game, Eggman's final fortress, an impossibly huge ship to navigate, and Eggman sends out the cavalry, some of the toughest enemies you've ever faced, in the heart of enemy territory. Lasers firing, it's the final shot before facing off against Eggman. There's no doubt in my mind that this is my favorite set of levels in all of Sonic and the soundtrack which accompanies them is also one of my all-time favorites. I think Heroes actually does quite a lot to harken back to the aesthetic feel of the classics. These levels would feel right at home on the Genesis, both visually and musically, all from a gameplay style which, on paper, sounds like an absolute disaster. You know what else is an absolute disaster? The fact that you, yes you, don't have a website. There's really no excuse to not have a website these days. Even I have one. If you're interested, I've partnered with Squarespace for this video to offer you a chance to make one. Be it for music, art, merchandise, whatever, Squarespace can accommodate your needs, I assure you. I use my Squarespace website as a hub for newly released videos, 
updates on future videos, and more to come as I further develop its features. Link in the description if you're interested. You can make anything you want after you watch their easily digestible tutorials and sleek, intuitive building tools. Trust me, if I can make a website, you can too. There are step-by-step -step guides on what to do first. You can pick from dozens of potential pre-made styles, or scrap it all and start from scratch. They have hundreds of fonts to choose from. You can make things transparent, add color to the background, make image or video files your background. You can blur those images. You can add a store page if you're looking to sell music, art, or other merchandise. You can basically do anything to personalize your site for any use you want it to have. Seriously, if you're a musician, artist, graphic designer, I guarantee you Squarespace will be helpful to you. So if you're looking to get started using Squarespace, you can begin your free trial today at squarespace.com slash kingk using the code kingk to get 10% off your first purchase. That's squarespace.com slash kingk using the code KingK to get 10% off your first purchase. There's really no excuse not to have a website these days, so get started now with the easiest, most accessible tool. So, the trouble with this video is that there's still a significant chunk of time left for you to watch. All I've done up to this point is praise the hell out of it, and the title is Sonic Heroes is a Lovable Mess. I'm sure a lot of you have been waiting for the other, uh, What's the phrase? I love Sonic Heroes, I truly do. And yet, I do think it's also a really messy one. I love Sonic Adventure 2 pretty much in its entirety, without too many disclaimers. Yeah, there's a few things here and there I don't like, a few nitpicks. Ultimately, I think it's a really well-rounded game that most people can enjoy. Despite its divisiveness amongst fans, I personally have a hard time viewing it as all that messy. I just think it's an iconic classic, sorry to say. I can't say that for Heroes, so my love for it comes with many an asterisk. The first of which concerns the lack of polish. This is something present in both of the adventure games to a lesser extent, though I feel like a lot of it is somewhat overblown. Heroes, though? Yeah, you really do get the feeling that this was a rushed project. It's not just the glitches. I mean, oh boy, those do exist, let me tell you. It's worth noting that the GameCube version is much less glitchy than the others, but you still get some pretty weird interactions sometimes. Flying off ramps wrong, rail hopping, breaking entirely, and getting stuck on pinball tables. But less than the lack of technical polish, I think the general feeling of jank can be attributed more so to things like the characters sliding around like the ground's made of butter. At high speeds, it can be a little hard to precisely maneuver Sonic without flying into walls, and when you pair a movement that chaotic with bottomless pits and enemies around those bottomless pits, sometimes you'll just be tapping away at the attack button with knuckles, and the next moment you've slid off into the abyss below. Maybe you'll die in this crocodile section, because trying to judge when you're supposed to hit the button can be really awkward on these jump ropes. Or maybe you'll be in Casino Park, where the pinball tables are nonsensical enough to drive you mad, and characters just sort of fall off and disappear for no discernible reason. Something about the way you control in the pinball sections isn't right. It's like you're constantly wrestling with the controls to get where you need to go. I suppose it emulates pinball well, in that sense. God forbid you enter a special stage, a requirement to unlock the last story. It's a novel idea, inside a tube chasing Chaos Emeralds, picking up orbs, and avoiding spike balls. But the way Sonic and friends control inside this inner tube is downright god-awful. Good luck staying on the bottom. If there's so much as a 15 degree turn, you'll start spinning around your directional change along with it, and you'll lose control for a minute. All the while, the emerald gets away and you have to replay the stage again, pick up the damn key, and never get hit by a single enemy just so you can fail the special stage again. Like, in theory, finding a key hidden in the level and taking it to the end without getting hit is a neat challenge. But a lot of the time, whether or not you get hit or die isn't up to you. It's up to whatever mood Heroes happens to be in. It's to the point where sometimes I'll run into a frustrating enough accident that I'll have to take a bit of a break, or risk tearing my head off. Eventually, though, you can learn to roll with the punches, and mostly avoid these problems. Air attack with knuckles on treacherous ground so you don't risk flying off the edge with a ground attack. Jump from rail to rail manually instead of trying to switch the intended way. Never switch to another character on the pinball tables. The player shouldn't have to do this, but if you want to avoid the headaches, you might as well get used to it. Sorry about the boss fights, though. You're gonna need to take some Tylenol or something. There's no getting around how tedious they can be. 
Aside from Egghawk, where you can just slam Knuckles into it and the fight's over, each of these boss battles is uniquely frustrating. Whether it be the endurance tests of Egg Albatross and the enemy gauntlets, or the absolutely batshit confusing character battles, there's not much to love here. Egg Albatross is a cool idea, a giant ship you have to take apart piece by piece, but in practice, it's a bit of a slog. Either you're a speedrunner and you can kill it in 5 seconds by baiting the thing towards you and spamming Knuckles' ground attacks, or you take the casual approach and spam the hell out of Sonic's homing attack. There's just not a lot to do here. And if you break a section while over a grind rail, the camera will come back at an awkward angle causing you to run into an enemy and fall off. Trust me, this has happened to me more times than I care to admit. So inevitably, whenever I reach this boss, I turn my brain off and mash. Riveting. The enemy gauntlets are a bit more stimulating. It's fun to try collecting as many level ups as possible, finding the quickest and most effective ways to deal with the enemies for a high rank. Good on them for making the boss A ranks entirely time based, so I don't feel too bad for trying to cheese them. They're just not all that exciting. The second one in particular really outstays its welcome. There are only so many types of enemy in the game, and so many combinations they can throw at you. Enemies work really well as obstacles to your speed. They're not necessarily going to work quite the same when you're plopped into a room and forced to wail on them. There are some sections like that in Final Fortress that get on my nerves a little bit. Team Blast also means you can just skip the hardest ones for free. I kinda like Team Blast in the levels, because you have to decide where the best place to use it is. You don't want to hang on to it for too long or you'll just be wasting time, but you don't want to use it prematurely and also lose time. But in the enemy gauntlets, you pretty much just let it rip as soon as you get it. Conceptually, character battles should be the best of this bunch. There's a rock-paper-scissors thing going on with the formations. You've got to use one formation to counter another. In theory, of course. In practice, these battles play out like you suddenly gave your controller to a monkey and it started mashing random buttons. Will you win? Uh, it's like a 50-50. There are a few strategies that seem consistent enough. Tornado attacking rapidly in the GameCube version, or flying off as far as you can to bait your enemies into jumping after you and into the pit, only works some of the time. If you try taking these character battles seriously, what's going to end up happening is essentially nothing. You'll get stunned a lot, your teammates will end up dead, and then you'll be at the mercy of an endless stun lock. It's not fun. What's worse is that you won't just be doing these boss encounters once, you'll be doing them four times. Yeah, so your favorite part of Sonic Adventure? Fighting Chaos 4 a dozen times? Why don't we do that for every one of our awful boss fights? What a thrill. I guess I don't mind repeating Egg Emperor, he feels like the most well-realized fight. There's a section where you're clearly meant to play as Sonic, chasing after him as you avoid vertical and horizontal sword slices. Then, when he stops to throw rockets at you, you've got to break his shield with knuckles, and maybe stop the cannons if they're bothering you too much. Then, when the core is exposed, you can use the flight character, or pretty much anyone depending on your level. Picking up the power-ups along the way will help make this process go by a little more quickly. You get a nice incentive to switch, the fight is a nice length, and the music is kick-ass. No complaints there. Yeah, so I think we've already clued in on the next point of contention. You have to play Sonic Heroes four times in a row to unlock the last story. Now, it's not as laborious as it might sound initially. Each of the four teams have slightly altered levels. Though they all go to the same locations, in the same order, there will be a few additions to spice up the proceedings. Team Dark levels will generally be longer, filled with tougher enemies, more bottomless pits. It's functionally this game's hard mode. On the flip side, you get Team Rose. Shorter levels, less enemies, invincibility boxes aplenty, and a bunch of gates which force you into team formations, taking away a lot of the decision making associated with form changing. Easy mode. Finally, Team Chaotix is a bit of a mission mode, where you're tasked with collecting items or destroying objects. Even as a concept, this idea is a bit of a stretch. No matter how you dress things up, each level will have the same visuals, the same music, the same basic premise, and the same boring boss fights to top everything off. Yeah, you'll see a few new sections of the level, there'll be tougher enemies, or you'll be looking for snails, but at the end of the day, there will be a lot of moments where you're traversing basically the same stretch of level, doing the same platforming challenges, or fighting the same enemies. There is a difference, you can feel it when you drop in, 
but it all tends to blur together for me. There's Team Sonic, and then there's the rest. Team Dark is probably the closest to what I would ideally want from a system like this. As I said, it's a hard mode. They'll start throwing you more difficult enemies earlier on, they'll add more to the level, they'll ask you to do some tougher platforming. It's a neat way to re-experience old levels, and since you're controlling a set of characters which don't play off each other in the same upbeat way that Team Sonic do, you get a vibe which is much more serious. It's kind of interesting to see the same basic events, except the main players are swapped out. For that alone, I find the second playthrough just as engaging as the first. But that charm doesn't really extend to baby mode and mission mode. Team Rose is so pathetically easy, so blindingly short, and so narratively pointless that I struggle to think of a justifiable reason for it to really be here. Like yeah, technically you can pick whichever team you want from the start, so theoretically the player could pick Team Rose first, but it seems like a weird way to implement an easy mode. I have never started with Team Rose, because Team Sonic is the standard route. On the off chance I'm not feeling Team Sonic, I can try Team Dark for a functionally identical, slightly harder run of the same game. But with Team Rose, it's always just gonna be Sonic Heroes Baby Mode. You get a good tutorial in the first two acts of Team Sonic, and the tutorial act you start Team Rose off with, which is much more patronizing, is selectable at any time for struggling players. I mean, I'm thankful it makes getting the Chaos Emeralds less of a chore, doesn't really mean I enjoy playing it. By the time I get the cool new characters from Knuckles Chaotix, it's already my fourth run around the block. Yeah, maybe this time I'm hunting for snails in Ocean Palace instead of reaching a goal ring, but the level design is pretty much the same. You still run down pathways, you still beat up enemies, glide up air shafts, whatever. You're just looking for snails along the way. And some of the missions, like Rail Canyon, are just, yeah, I need you to make it to the end of the level. Cool. Thanks. Really making the most out of my fourth trek through Rail Canyon, aren't we? Now, one could say that this is yet another way that Sonic Heroes embodies the essence of the classic Sonic games. You pick another character, run through the same levels, and even get to see new pathways or completely altered level design depending on who you pick. Except, in Sonic Heroes, you get an entirely new story for each team, so each of them are like their own little episodes that you can come back and play whenever you want. I really do wish this was the case, but alas, it never is that simple. I feel like the thing that bothers me about Heroes the most is the way it goes about structuring its four stories. Yeah, so you can consider me one of those filthy monkey brains who likes when my Sonic games have a bunch of eclectic characters. I don't know, I always liked that we seemed to pick up a new playable amigo with each game. As Sonic's cast has grown larger, the possibilities for more interesting stories to tell have grown in turn. I mean, yeah, don't get me wrong, I'll always love a good Sonic vs Eggman with Tails and Knuckles to tag along. The story here is simple. Eggman says he'll do something evil in a couple days, they vow to stop him. It takes them through a bunch of colorful locations, they have a few run-ins with the other teams, a lot of... banter... I think, you know, sometimes it's funny and endearing and I like it. Mushrooms on my island too, but not this huge. Ancient civilization established on the sea. This place is really beautiful. Primary target is Eggman. Don't forget it. But sometimes I do wish they'd shut up. Yeah, I'll give you that. I dig the simple vibes we get here when compared to the more ambitious stories they were telling in the adventure games. I even like the more lighthearted tone. Sometimes. Sonic and Friends are a bit more cheesy than usual, there's a bit more camp, and maybe it's just because I grew up playing it, but I can't help but smile when Knuckles starts teasing tales about ghosts, or Sonic talks about cracking that egghead wide open and wanting to party. It really doesn't take itself very seriously, but I find that it does it in a way that feels at least a little self-aware when compared to more modern attempts at doing something similar. Maybe it's just that I like Ryan's voice for Sonic more. I don't want to think it's something that negligible which makes me appreciate the game's writing, but who knows? I'm 23. Technically, I'm a Zoomer. Maybe this is just the cringy kid clawing out of my mouth. Team Dark and Team Chaotix are similarly really cool stories on their own. After the masterclass ending of Sonic Adventure 2, I'm still a bit weirded out that they chose to immediately resurrect Shadow like this, 
But at least the way they did it allows for a bit of mystery. Who brought him back? Is he a robot? Is that why he has no memory? Sonic's yet another property which exists under capitalism to appeal to as many people as possible to sell as much useless shit as possible. In other words, every property under capitalism. Yay! So Shadow coming back was pretty much inevitable. If he's gonna come back, I'm glad they were able to introduce it in Heroes, and they didn't solely try to bring him back through the game, which came after this one. Team Dark probably has the best team dynamic anyway, so it was worth it for that alone. A traitorous government spy working with the Amnesiac Ultimate Life Form and a maniacal rogue Eggman robot. It makes for an amusing combo. You two ready? Warning. Immediate destruction if distracted. Man, I really used to love Shadow, didn't I? It wasn't just some fluke. There was a time where I enjoyed how he was written. How funny. Shadow is still so cocky here. He was always envisioned as the dark mirror to Sonic. He's not some super edgy, angry guy. He naturally embodies the confidence and quick wit of Sonic, with only a slightly darker and more serious edge to him. I like that Omega and Shadow are a bit confrontational at first, but slowly warm up to each other as the story progresses. I think the dialogue being more lighthearted has had the side effect of making Shadow's commentary in particular a little too... self-aggrandizing. There's a point where Shadow just says, I will find out who I am at the beginning of Frog Forest, and it's a little bit of a random thing for him to blurt out, kind of strange. It's also a little weird how calm Sonic is when they meet up. Something doesn't entirely add up with this whole Shadow situation. The way his comeback is written could have been tuned slightly better, but it's still the Shadow I know and love. Getting to play as him again in a story that's meaningful for his character is all I really need out of this exchange. Team Chaotix is an absolutely brilliant way to repurpose a set of older characters. A group of detectives barely making ends meet, living for the next job. They're essentially the big old goofballs of Sonic Heroes, in the best way possible. It just seems like they're having a blast, I don't know how else to describe it. I can see why a lot of people would find Charming annoying, but I just love how much he seems to be enjoying himself. He's elated at the idea they have a new job to do. Espio is cool and calculated, kinda quiet but he lets his innocence show every now and then. I mean, he starts saying that he'll unleash his ninja power, or whatever. Dude's a total dork. And Vector's the big brute keeping them together. The muscle, the leader, and the terrible singer. Their team blast makes me smile every time I see it. So we've got three cool little stories to go through, and then Team Rose. Sonic is framed, there's a misunderstanding where Amy and the others think Sonic stole Cream's Chow and Froggy. They go off and do levels, get them back. There's not much going on here. Though the pairing of Amy, Cream, and Big is pretty well done, I'll give them props for that. They fit really well together, and I never would have expected it. But hey, it mostly works, and I love that all of the teams get some crossover moments here and there. They really do have to stretch logic to make it work, though. Man, who are those creeps over there? What's up, SBO? And you are... Just what do you think you're doing here? Who's this broad? Our client's adversary, perhaps. You mean the bad guys? You guys don't fool me. I know what you're after. Better stay out of my way! Couldn't have come up with a better way for that fight to start, eh? Like, they actually went through the effort of making Team Chaotix collect Chow in the Lost Jungle right before encountering Team Rose, so at least there's a reason for them to fight there that makes sense from a narrative perspective, but Team Dark and Team Chaotix... Uh... Yeah, I guess theoretically you could just play this game and treat the other teams as alternate ways to play the same game. You don't really have to do them all if you don't want to, you can just come back at a later date and play another character if you want. But that isn't really what Sonic Heroes is. There's a last story to unlock, where all of these disparate storylines intersect. Yeah, we've done this song and dance before. I really do respect the way this crossover is envisioned. Instead of a regular bout against Eggman, Metal Sonic is the main antagonist masquerading as Eggman. He's collecting data from various teams to gain enough power to evolve into his big, epic final boss form. I think this is a really cool way to bring Metal Sonic into 3D. It's appropriate, and I'll always get a kick out of seeing everyone come together for the final hurrah. There is a very easy pathway into my heart. 
Unfortunately, I think this final story lands more on the Adventure 1 end of the spectrum, in that the way it's written and structured is so much more messy than it really needs to be. You need to play these four stories in a row and collect the Chaos Emeralds across the seven levels with any of the teams. You'll be playing the same levels with very minor alterations four times over until you're just dropped into the last story, where suddenly Metal Sonic reveals himself, evolves, and everyone starts fighting. Sonic goes super, Tails and Knuckles are put in some frankly lame bubbles. I wanted to see some super forms. They defeat Metal Sonic and all's well that ends well. I guess. Man, I just don't know. There are some parts of this final confrontation that are totally worth slogging through four playthroughs to reach. Hearing the best song from Crush 40 play as you battle Metal Sonic in the skies, fending off missiles, having Knuckles rip through battleships thrown at you from Eggman's fleet, it's a pretty damn epic finale, and I like that the other teams play a role in defeating him. But at the end of the day, they're fighting a copy-paste, relatively simple boss fight where you switch forms based on whatever color you're shown three times over until you launch into the super portion. It's hard to get over how quickly everything happens. The Metal Sonic reveal, everyone coming together, fighting, and then the conclusion. Is it really worth the uphill battle it takes to reach when your reward is less than half an hour of new content? I'm not even asking for something as in-depth as the finale to Sonic Adventure 2, and yet I can't help the feeling that this was a massive step down. I know this is asking for too much, I'm not even saying this would have been possible for Sonic Team to have achieved in a reasonable amount of time, but this whole thing really would have hit better if the teams each had their own set of levels. I know, I know, the game's rushed as it is, would have been impossible. I'm just telling you how it is. The fact of the matter is, playing these levels so many times gets extremely tiring, and playing this extra boss fight feels less like a culmination of various story threads and more like an extra little bonus. Ultimately, it's hard for me to say that it's worth it to play all four. There's a reason I've only fully played this game two or three times throughout my life, and yet I've played Team Sonic more times than I can count. Thus, here I am at the exact same mental headspace I found myself with Sonic Adventure 1. Team Sonic is great, everything else is a bit... less. Nevertheless, Sonic Heroes is one of my favorites. It's still a struggle to explain, really. By all accounts, it doesn't seem like I should love it. Much like Sonic Adventure, there's one part of the game that I continue to play over and over again, and there are other parts I can take or leave. But as exhausting as four different playthroughs is, as much as I wish the game was structured differently, as much as I wish it got more time in the oven, a chance to iron out the frustrating kinks, at the end of the day, these are basically the same levels. Whether they're more difficult, more of a cakewalk, or they ask you to defeat every enemy, these are the same set of kick-ass levels with amazing visual theming and some of the best music in the series. I flat out don't like Sonic Adventure's full package. I like a small slice of it. But Sonic Heroes? Yeah, it's a huge mess, but at its core, it's fun. I like replaying it. Sure, maybe I play Team Sonic more than the rest, but coming back to finally play every team again for the first time in a long while, I had a good time. There are sections in Sonic Adventure where I just wanted to be doing something else. Playing as Tails, Amy, and Big was kind of miserable, with Knuckles and Gamma only managing to feel like decent side attractions to the main event. And on top of that, you end up running around the overworld way more than is necessary, playing a bunch of the same levels again. A lot of that game is a slog to revisit. I don't feel that with Heroes. It's still a series of highs and lows, but they're much more consistent and much more manageable. No matter how many times you have to play it, at least you're pretty much playing the same game the whole way through. It's not so much a start drop off Mount Everest as much as it is driving down a road full of potholes. But hey, it got me where I needed to be. It's a mess, it's not pretty, but it's a hell of an enjoyable time. It'll never be easy to explain why I love playing it so much, but hey, sometimes it doesn't make sense. Love doesn't make sense. It doesn't follow a set of rules. I love Sonic Heroes for the mess that it is, and I think I came to terms with that a long time ago.
right. Level up.